What? All right. I guess I can talk to you for a minute. Just don't tell my centurion. It's uh, been a crucifixion day. We had three up today. Two of the regular lowlifes and a guy from Galilee, who some you said was a king. A common terrorist, more like. Still, if this is how they treat their kings, I wouldn't be putting my hand up. Must say though, this guy took all the rough stuff without shrinking. None of the usual screaming and cursing. I even heard him say he forgave us for what we were doing. For gave us. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that. My centurion was quite affected by it, although. Never thought he'd be like that. And then, the weather. That was weird. All dark in the middle of the afternoon. Almost like the gods didn't approve of what was happening, if you believe in that stuff. So, it's uh, pretty like worth they standing around all day, just keeping the crowd damped down, waiting for the crims to give up and die. We usually pass the time by dividing up the spoils, the cloths and stuff. We had a quick game today, instead of ripping up the best bit. But I didn't win. I never do. In the end, we had to break up the guy's legs, but the king guy was already gone. Justice did the spear thing to check. And now I've just heard that the Jewish big deals want a guard on the king's tomb for the next few nights. And guess who's been stuck with it? Guarding a dead guy in a tomb. Talk about a long weekend. I mean, what do they think is going to happen? <sighs> anyway, got to go. Worked to do. <sighs> Hello friend. I'm I'm happy to talk, but to be honest, I'm not quite sure what to say to you. My whole understanding of the world has feels like it's fallen apart. I've lost the person I love the most, and more than that, I've lost the person I put all my hope into. My hope for my people, my hope for the world, my hope for myself. And everything that's happened today just doesn't make sense, unless he was wrong about everything, including who he was. But even in the, the pain and the torture of it all, he, he didn't seem crushed or, or even surprised or disappointed. He, he was calm and, and accepting and, and you, you could almost say he was willing to suffer. I, I, I don't know. Do you, do you know what he did? I was standing near the cross. I, I, I did run away on Thursday night with the others. But, but, but I, I came back and I figured I, if I stayed quiet, I could hang around there without attracting attention. I'm, I'm younger than the other disciples and obviously I'm not very threatening. Um, so I, I was standing there and, and Mary, his, his mother, she was also there and she was looking up at the cross. So I went over to her uh, because I've, I've always had a bit of a soft spot for her and, and she for me, I think. Uh, so, so I went over to her and we hear this cracked, painful voice come 
from, from up above us. And, and he says, woman, here is your son. And, and then, here is your mother. It's just like him, really, to remember to care for other people and, and, and to love them, even with the last bit of life that he had left. So I've lost a saviour, and I've gained a mother. It's, it's my privilege, of course. I'm, I'm glad to do it as, as much as I can be glad about anything right now. Speaking of Mary, it's, it's getting late, so I should really uh, take her back to the house we've been staying at. Uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, I'm Joanna. I guess I can talk to you. Salome and Mary and I are just back from seeing them bury our dear Lord at a rich man's tomb. Seeing that huge stone just grind and thunk into place made my stomach turn. It is the end of the longest and most awful day in my entire life. And now every day after this is just going to be the same. No hope, no joy, no Jesus. We really believe that he was the one, the Messiah sent from God. He believed he would bring us to the kingdom and set Israel free. All those words he said, I am the way, the truth, I am the life, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world. What good are those words now? I saw him perform miracles you wouldn't believe. I saw people healed, I saw Blind people seeing. I saw Lazarus walk out of his grave. I kept, when I watched this morning, I just kept expecting him to part the crowd, to slip away like he'd always done before. Even somehow to get down from the cross. But there was nothing like that. I don't understand. He just let them win. What will we do now? Where will we go? What? I'm sorry. I, I don't want to talk about this anymore. What? I am not going to do another interview on Sunday. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Good morning again. It's great to uh, share with you from God's word and we want to just remember this criminal on a cross this morning. Remember me, he says, and I, I wonder what shifted this man from mockery through to this exclamation. Remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. He was able to see something that nobody else could at that time. In Matthew chapter 27, it says of the two criminals crucified either side of Jesus that they mocked him along with the crowd. They hurled insults at him. And this man, we need to remind ourselves, was a criminal. And uh, some say he was a thief. But actually, crucifixion was a, a means of execution reserved for not common thieves, 
but for terrorists, enemies of the state. Whatever this man did, it wasn't just simply stealing things. It's likely that he had murder, brutality, these kinds of things on his record. And it was safe for these kinds of people. The Roman Empire wanted to make examples of terrorists and enemies of the state. That is indeed why they crucified Jesus. And that's why that, this man was crucified. And I've met some people like this man. Brutality is their natural form. That's their normal. Mockery is their native language. And selfishness is the way that they've learnt how to survive. That's what this man would have been like. And in fact, the first thief that we heard of is just like we would expect. The first criminal says insults. He has a lot of self-interest. There's no sense in that man that there's any guilt. He's simply desperate to be saved. So he says to Jesus, if you are the Messiah, save yourself and save us. He's not persuaded at all that Jesus is anybody or anything. He's just desperate to get off the cross somehow. Maybe he's making an appeal to Jesus that some miracle might happen, but probably he's appealing to the rulers and the leaders that are down below, maybe they might have some sympathy for him, just like they had for Barabbas, the one exchanged in Jesus' place. And that's where the second thief, second criminal started. He started with mockery. He started with insults. And there's no surprise in that. When you put pressure on people who've lived a hard life, their instinctive response is, violence, anger, self-preservation. There's no surprise that when a man's crucified on a cross and he's lived the life that this criminal has, that he'd insult anybody. But when we pick up in Luke chapter 23, when we see this man, something is different about him. He's changed. Did you hear the, you probably didn't hear the prayer of Jesus just prior to this. But just prior to the passage, Jesus prays this. In all of his suffering, he prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And I wonder if the criminal heard that prayer and something about that prayer, whether it stirred in his heart that he needed to receive forgiveness. Or maybe, maybe it was God's first answer to prayer, what happened in this man. But now he is changed. His heart is different. That in the midst of this horrible, brutal suffering that he's experiencing on the cross, he sees Jesus in a way that nobody else is seeing him. He really sees Jesus. His mockery stops. He rebukes that first criminal with these words, Don't you fear God? Since you under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. We can see clearly his change of heart. He speaks now of fearing God. He's got a sense that he's accountable to the creator of the universe. He knows that he's dying and that he will see this creator soon. He also knows that there are no second chances after this. Don't you fear God? This is the time that will really matter. We have hours to live and you spend those hours by insults and mockery. And in that fear, he knows what he's, get, he's getting what he deserves. Don't you fear God? Since we are under the same, we are punished justly, he says. We're getting what we deserve. I don't know if this is the first time he's admitted that, but he admits it now. In the face of Jesus, he understands he is a guilty man. And then he knows Jesus. It seems he knows him because he appeals to him. But he knows that Jesus is not the same as him, that Jesus hasn't stolen. He hasn't taken life. He hasn't brutalized people. This man has done nothing wrong. We can see in this thief very quickly a change of heart. I wonder if you can see his faith. This is incredible faith. This man can see past the nails and the blood, the cross, 
the mockery. And in faith, he sees Jesus and he says this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, Jesus' disciples, who'd walked with him for three and something years, had abandoned him, abandoned him because they held fear for their own life. They couldn't see what this man saw. And then the crowds that had waved palm branches and thrown their cloaks down on Palm Sunday, well, they'd abandoned Jesus. What they shouted on one day, they were no longer prepared to stand for this day. He was not the king that expected. But this criminal is one that everybody would think nothing of. Sees Jesus. He sees a crucified man next to him and he sees this man as a king coming into his kingdom. I mean, this man had no resurrection to stand on. He did not know that was coming. He did not know that Jesus would be ascending to the right hand of the Father. He had no church to belong to. He had nothing but the bloodied man next to him. And he says to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This man's hope is centered on Jesus alone, nothing else. He has no other hope apart from the person of Jesus. And his hope comes from Jesus' words to him, saying, you will be with me in paradise. Some people talk of living their lives as if they could live it on their own terms and then come their dying breath, they'll turn to God. I mean, in many ways, this story reminds us of the great grace of God. It doesn't matter when you turn to him, God is willing and graceful to have you. But the question I would have is, do you have this man's faith? Do you have the kind of faith that can see past all the mockery, all the trivialities, all the insults, a lifetime of ignoring God, and then come to the end of sowing into that ground those seeds, come to the end of this life and still choose Jesus? My, my question is not whether God would choose you. My question is whether you would choose him after so long. I want to remind you that the first thief, the crowds, the leaders, and the soldiers who insulted Jesus and saw nothing in him is the normal response. That's what people do when they reject God. They cannot see past themselves. And if you think that you will live a lifetime on your own terms, then suddenly have such a change of heart in the final few minutes of your life, final hours, then you are deceiving yourself on who you really are and who you will really become. And if that were to happen, it would only be by the grace of God, which is what this man knows. He knows that he needs to fear God. He knows that he has lived a life that deserves punishment. And he knows that his only hope is found in Jesus right at this point. You don't need to wait to the end of your life to know that. And how does Jesus respond to a faith that throws its entire life into his hand? Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. I want you to notice that at one level, nothing changes for this criminal. He's still crucified to a cross, gasping for breath. He is still going to spend hours dying. And come the very end, he will have those soldiers, which you have heard mentioned, come around and break his legs so that he will die. Nothing at one level has changed for this man. But this one thing has changed. He has hope. He doesn't have just a bleak, pitiful, painful death. He has hope. He has hope in Jesus. Jesus says this very day, 
you'll be with me in paradise. This very day, I will remember you. And that's the power in Jesus' word of promise. Is whatever you're in, you've got those words. They're truth. They're worth staking your life on. They can take the most hopeless of situations and actually bring hope. Throughout scripture, we see God remembering people. And it's powerful. It says God remembered Noah when he and the animals were floating in the flood. God remember Abraham in the wake of Sodom and Gomorrah's fall. God remembered Hannah when she cried out to the Lord in her barrenness. God remembered Rachel and her desires for children. God remembered Israel when they were subject to the hand of Pharaoh. This is powerful when God remembers you. He doesn't forget your circumstance. He'll turn things around. He'll act for your good. And this is the request that the criminal makes of Jesus. Remember me. Don't forget me. Act for my good. Can you turn things around? Is that something you would pray? <sighs> A few years ago when my just born daughter was dying, I prayed that she might live. Isabel was her name. When she died, this was my prayer. Remember her. Remember her, Jesus. Don't forget her. Act for her good. This is what the criminal asked for himself. His prayer. Remember me. I have nothing else. And I wonder if that's something you'd want to pray. Maybe you are someone who's been holding off and giving your life fully, completely to Jesus. Because you think you've got time. And I certainly hope you do. But there's a better way of living. You won't hear this often in church. I'm going to say, follow the example of this criminal. Because he asked Jesus a prayer that Jesus was quick to answer. Remember me, Jesus, in your grace. Remember me. And when Jesus remembers him, he's got a promise at last, past his life. But that for those of us who aren't close to that, that promise lasts into this life too. It makes every difference for us. When we have challenge, we know that Jesus remembers us. When we go through tra tragedy, we know that Jesus remembers us. When those we love pass on and in their hope in Jesus, we who remain know that he remembers them. And that's the prayer I pray you would want. For those of us who are of faith, who trust Jesus already, isn't this the prayer that we already pray? You may not have known it, but those prayers where you wake up and wonder how you're going to make it through this day, Basically, you've probably prayed without words, remember me, Jesus. 
in your challenge, remember me. And even as you plan for all your hopes, remember me. I'm going to come to the table now. It's interesting, I'll let Miranda speak to it, but this is a table of remembering. But as we, as I just finish now, let's put out this seventh candle here and say these words. As this candle passes, Lord Jesus, remember us.